Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Shop Notes Podcast. This is episode 77. I am Logan Whitmer, joined by John. That's right. This is episode number two of the John and Logan Show. Will Phil come back next week? We don't know. We might not let him. So let's get into it. This episode of the Shop Notes Podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. <laughs> I love the mystery. I know. Like, we don't know if he's coming back, will yep. he? Will he, get, will he get lost in southern the jungles of southern Missouri? Right. Who knows? Edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe he just don't want. Maybe he just doesn't want to come back. I, and I don't blame him. No, I mean, you especially know. after this week, I don't think he wants to come back here. Right, and I'm I'm sure he watched uh, last week's or listened to last week's <laughs> podcast and thought these two guys are doing such a great job that <laughs> they don't even need me anymore. So, uh, yeah. So uh, I figured this week. So last week I had asked a question about. Uh, it was just kind of off the cuff, but I got a lot of response to it. So I thought it'd be a fun thing to kind of go through some of these responses uh, about building a shop, about the potentials mm-hmm. of building a shop. And I got a lot of feedback from our, our listeners, viewers, people from our people. And I kind of wanted to run through some of it and see, uh, just kind of share some of it to see what mm-hmm. everybody thinks about it. So sure. um, I'm, real quick, I'm going through some of the, YouTube comments. Um, so Mike Fleming said, you know, if I were building a new shop, I would not embed the dust collection on the floor, which is the general consensus right now. Uh, what it would I do if something new came along like CNC? Uh, that's completely fair. Um, you would be pretty locked in unless you set up hubs, right? Like we talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I get it. Um, he also said for the shop, you know, he'd like more for floor space than he currently has, which is a double garage. But more importantly, he would like more height, which is something that I don't think a lot of people think about. Um, what's yeah. what's the height in your garage, John? It's just the standard eight foot. So, okay. yeah, it's pretty easy to be flipping over a piece of wood and hit a light or hit the ceiling or we kind of take for granted that in the shops here or in the studio here at work, we have extra tall ceilings and then yeah so we have plenty of room and then plus you can hang you know your air filtration and 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 uh we have our dust collection pipes up near the ceiling so if you had a standard eight foot ceiling it's going to start getting lower and lower as you add stuff yeah. so it's 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 nice to have that extra capacity yeah. above you yeah so currently i have nine foot ceilings in my shop in the basement and i think i feel like that's bare minimum for me personally, right. I mean, obviously I can work with whatever I need to, but I feel like that's pretty bare minimum, especially when you add, like you said, a hanging dust collect, a uh, dust filter up, uh, up on the ceiling. And I also have, um, Oh, they're like the hanging fluorescent lights, but they're LEDs. Um, mm-hmm. super bright. I love them, but they hang down about a foot. So really I have, I have areas in my shop that I can only stand eight foot up before I start knocking in and stuff. So, but that's yeah. that's a great I mean, that's a Mike brings up a great point there. Height is almost as important as floor space. So mm-hmm. um, he mentioned that you know being on a limited budget, he's not sure that the extra costs associated with plumbing would be justified. Um, he said, "I'm not sure about the toilet and the sink, but a sink for cleaning brushes would certainly be handy." Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, you know that's a, that is something that I had priced out to put into my shop when I built my house in my shop. Um, I priced them putting uh, water and sewer in my shop, so I would be able to have a utility sink. And the cost then was outrageous. I mean, it's like you're only going, you're only moving like four extra feet. Like if I can sneak in there one night, I'll do it before you guys pour the concrete. You know. But it was like yeah. three grand they wanted to do it. I'm like, oof, wow. that was not worth yeah. it. Yeah, it's definitely a luxury. But if you want to save a little money, I mean, if you had a sink, do you really need a toilet? <laughs> I, was, I, mean, I knew it was coming. Save a little bit of cost? <laughs> I, know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and another thing that Mike brings up, which is another great point, is uh, he's another you know point to consider is power. 
uh, which is true, and that's a big mm-hmm. one. Um, he has two 40 amp circuits, or he has a 40 amp circuit, two breakers in my house that feed a sub panel in the garage, and have two 20 amps coming in that that run the plugs and lights. Um, the yeah, uh, so right now I have a 60 amp sub panel in my shop fed from the garage. Um, I think. Uh, John, do you have a panel for your garage, or are you running off a breaker in the house? Uh, I have a like just a small separate panel. Okay, from the in, in my garage. Yeah. Do you so know how much power it is? I don't, I don't know. Okay. I'd have to look, but I yeah, I don't have two twenty in the garage. I've been able to get by without it, but gotcha. See, and I I so. ran my when I built mine. I did run alternating, like every three feet. There's a well. Every six feet, there is a 220, and every six feet opposite. So every three feet, there's an outlet, but they alternate between 220 and 110. Mm-hmm. Um, my my dad happens to be an electrician, uh, so I had a lot of parts for free. So I just put it in because yeah. I had it. So uh, <laughs> it was definitely a – I followed the mentality. I put way more outlets than I expected I needed, and mm-hmm. I still find myself thinking, dang it, if there was one outlet right here, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I find that, um, I mean, I have, you know, plenty of outlets, it seems like, but a lot of times you know, I move stuff around or stuff gets covered up. So I, I feel like I'm grabbing extension cords and just plugging in wherever I can. And, yeah. And kind of, so it's nice if you have lots of outlets and different heights as well. Um, I think on one side of the garage, I have it all at like bench height outlets. Yep. So I'm not covering those up when I have my workbench up against the wall yeah. or, whatever so yeah, i've kind of grown fond of these screw on power strips for the wall mm-hmm. um like the like the longer thin ones um, not like a standard one that we'd use at our computer but like the longer shop ones that they rotate to close and they rotate to open mm-hmm. um i have a couple of those in my shop right now i really like those now you can't put a bunch of stuff on them but they work pretty well for when you mm-hmm. need to plug stuff in i uh, usually so- just use um christmas lights as yes. extension cords. <laughs> I mean, we have a lot. You're not using them most of the year, so it's like. And it's extra light in the shop. Right. right? You just lighten up the shop. And, oh, there's nothing like know. 28 gauge wire for your. Right? Isn't that right? The I thin, don't know. The, Probably. The thinner you go, the, the yeah. lighter the cord that is. Sounds so right. like I'm sure we'll get corrected by cord. an I mean, electrician. But That's all right. We should all right, like so. use that as a. Um, shop tip in the magazine <laughs> and see what kind of anger we get back just throw oh, one of those in each issue just yeah to, like the spoof tip yeah just to oh, get a response from people that'd be great uh so i'm working down the youtube comments right now uh kevin thomas said better late than never yep sorry we're a two-man show last week and this week so it yeah. went up a little later on friday morning but you still got it yep uh, we'll give you a refund on this episode <laughs> uh, uh Ian uh, Dingwall says, I built a 45 by 35 shop. Inside, he made a 17 by 17 enclosed work area for woodworking. Uh, for cutting with saws, both table and cutoff, I set them outside this area. Uh, he used scissor trusses because they're restricted to 19, it, mu- it must be to 19 foot total roof height. Uh, mm-hmm. And it gave him some storage above the 17 by 17. Uh, lots of electrical outlets and good lighting. He put a toilet and a laundry sink in a small bathroom, which is kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, but uh, put in wiring to operate a compressor outside of the work area and planning to run airlines around the whole shop. Uh, natural gas heat in the area, and at this, stop, at this time, half of the whole shop is for my motorhome to reside. We live in the rainforest of British Columbia. Ooh, oh, jealous. Wow. Uh, slowly insulating and drywalling the whole inside uh, as the gas heater I have is large enough to heat the whole shop. Good lighting, heat, air system, lots of outlets, uh, some sort of dust system, and bathrooms are his ideas. Which, that's all good. You know, I like, Ian, I like the uh, I like the idea of wiring for a compressor outside the shop. Because I hate, hate listening to air compressors run. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm in my shop and myself, not that big a deal, I just put my... my um, Bluetooth earmuffs on, um, but I like the idea of setting it outside of the work area. Uh, so when I was talking about building a, a machine shed, that would work well because I could 
I would have only a, about a third of it would be workshop, but I could plumb the air compressor to be in the main machine shop area or mm-hmm. the machine shed area and not worry about it. So kind of cool. Yeah. Or it'd be nice just to have an area where you can kind of enclose it and insulate it. And Yeah. I've seen some people do that where away, they but... like soundproof it kind of, mm-hmm. you know, that would be cool. Um, I do. John, what's your, what's your opinion on, do you like the plumbed in airlines or not? Um, I do like them for convenience, but then it like here in our, in the shop, um, at work where they're plumbed in, it's always seems like there's like one leaky valve or <laughs> yeah. something that's always hissing. So you're going around and shutting things off and, yep. but I mean, they are nice for convenience, but it just depends how much you use them and like around the shop. If you have one little area that you're using, yeah. um, compressor tools or yep. whatnot, then it's probably not necessary but if you have an area where you're you know doing a lot of air tools and then you have a separate area where you need it for finishing then it might be nice to to run some lines yeah i will say i do like the convenience in our shop here of having mm-hmm. air always in that line so like if i'm done turning i can just walk over blow myself off real quick and mm-hmm. i'm done yep. super nice so uh next down the list is top shelf english said 19 19- or 3918, whoosh, right over Logan's head. Don't worry, John, the rest of us got it. <laughs> well, Mr. English, I did get it. I just happen to have calluses from John, so I can yeah. just generally skim over stuff like that. I think it was a comment yeah. about how me setting the uh, the <laughs> me setting the dust collection in the concrete was permanent, unlike marriage. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I got it. Yeah, kind of like probably like my wife if I say some sort of – smart alecky thing i've said before she just doesn't doesn't react. even react which is so then i say it louder <laughs> like did you hear me i was like, gonna say it's so annoying when they don't react to it right uh, so then you gotta repeat yourself yep. like yeah i heard you yep so, um but. a couple of people had mentioned about uh the perfectionist thing on a lot of people are say <laughs> rick b said not that i enjoy your mistakes but makes us common folk feel better when you perfectionists have things go wrong, uh, a.k.a. Yeah. he does enjoy our mistakes, <laughs> and then learn yeah. to fix it. Um, yeah, it's always nice watching someone else make the mistake, like Chris Fitch, <laughs> Mr. Perfect here, and then when we're filming, he'll <laughs> screw something up yeah. and then just totally be mad about it. And the best, w- like, Yeah, the best Chris Fitch one was when he was uh, – I don't remember what project. It was this season. He was just talking to somebody. He put the dado blade in backwards. You mm-hmm. remember that? And he was trying to cut yeah. with it. And he still got quite a bit of a cut done. It was like, something's wrong. There's a lot of smoke. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's like back routing. Yeah, exactly. Prevents chip out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, But Rick also said that underfloor dust, ducts, and outlets in a location in the center of the floor where a table saw would most likely live makes sense to him, but not plumbing mm-hmm. the full shop uh, for underfloor. Um, so, and he said water plumbing's a must. I still kind of am following that. I'm mm-hmm. kind of agreeing with that. Could you just put in um, one of those like drainage pits and then sweep everything into that? Like, you know, like people put in the oil. Yeah, like, like an oil pit. Yeah, I think so. Probably. Yeah, it's probably not a shop yeah. hazard at all. So, no. Um, plus, then it would be really easy to do oil changes on my truck. You just get in right. the sawdust pit, open up the, mm-hmm. the drain plug, and just let it go into the sawdust, right? Yep. Sawdust soaks it up. Yeah. And Don't worry about it. Good yeah. to go. So then I just would start flicking, like, cigar butts down there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Donald Miller said about a shed to do wood projects in, and now he wishes he would have got a bigger one for two reasons. Uh, next to the garage would be nice, and uh, he has uh, to have a cleanup and bathroom area and just in case you don't make it to the bathroom and stack it uh <laughs> to do a show like everybody else so i think he's saying to, to for like a, a video area so trust me don it's not as nice as it sounds <laughs> yeah uh and then wb fine woodworking with don bullock said uh when i retire my wife and I bought a new to us house and built a 24 by 40 shop garage on the property uh, before they moved. And when he said, when we're ready to get serious, I just, or when I'm ready to get serious, he said, suggest I'm getting online and studying building code for our area. Our house is in an area with very strict building code requirements, including the types of materials you can use. Uh, the types of building codes in your area will tell you what you can and cannot do. 
Uh, and also want, want to look at what the building will do to your property taxes, where I am, for example, putting a bathroom would have raised our taxes significantly when compared to the same building without one. Um, and then he goes on a little bit. I just actually clicked to show more and realized that Don had a lot more on here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, he said uh, for his build, he researched the project um, before finally finally contracting the build. Um, he chose to have the building prefabricated and built by Tough Shed. He said, yeah, they actually built garages. Their quote was much lower than several contractors for stick-built structures. And another contractor took care of the foundation, electrical, and drywall. Uh, he definitely agrees that climate control is necessary. We live in Southern California, which was going to be a lot drier than hotter than here. And he said uh, he went out with it, with, went out, went without it for 12 years, and now he wishes he didn't wait so long. He said, I no longer sweat on my work, which is, that is a, as a fat man, that is a problem. Like, as you're planing <laughs> something and there's just drips of sweat dropping and raising the grain, it sucks. Yep. Uh, and where we live, both AC and heat would be necessary. Um, Wi-Fi in the building comes from a mesh router system with the main router in the house. He said, uh, that system covers 6,000 square feet and can be extended easily to cover a larger area. And... He talks about the dust collection in the concrete. Said so he didn't do that, but he did put outlets in the floor where he plans to put his table saw. Um, and he said that worked out great. Two twin, the 220 serves the saw stop adjoiner. Uh, planer and dust collector is hooked up to the 110. All my wall outlets are a little above four feet, which is about where I put mine. And that keeps them from being hidden by sheets of plywood laying against the wall or being blocked by a machine or lower cabinet. Uh, and he has a link to his YouTube channel. And as I read this, I'm going to say, I will put this on the show notes page so everybody can take a look at it. Didn't do a show notes page for last week. Sorry, people. I will try to do that sometime soon. Um, but, you know, that's interesting, Don, because I, in my shop, I also put the outlets a little above four feet. I didn't think about the sheet goods leaning against the wall. Like, I didn't mm -hmm. mind that high because... I wanted when I would put like cabinets up against the wall, the outlet was above the cabinets, like you know, kind of like chest height. But that's a great idea, you know. Right. Yeah, kind of like I was saying, like you're always moving stuff yeah. around and leaning stuff against the wall and covering up outlets, so it's nice to have them at a height where you can. Yeah. What, how, how do you feel, John, about the zip stuff. reels for outlet for power cords? Is it I don't like we have a couple of those in the shop and it seems like they're always in the way. I mean, well, I think they're broke <laughs> in, in theory. They're really, yeah. They, maybe they just hang down too far. They yeah. don't go up as high as they should anymore and yeah. hit my head or yeah. well. And whatever, to but. be fair, I don't think that they are designed to have a four gang outlet box on them. <laughs> so that's a lot of way. Yeah, that could be it. That could be <laughs> because it. I have one in my shop right now and I, I, I don't know where I got it. I like put it up on, or I got it from the print shop I managed or something. It was in, like, the trash from somebody else's garage. So I mm -hmm. grabbed it. You know, I pulled a few Phil Huber and yanked it out of the, the dumpster and saved it. And I, I hung it up. I had to put new ends on it, but I, I hung it up in my shop. And I actually love that thing. It's only a single outlet. So it's like a, it's an extension cord reel, basically, that hangs on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Um, you're right. The one in the shop is always in the way. <laughs> it is always <laughs> in the way. And it might be that it's it's hung right in a walk like a walkway right now between and it might have been that we moved stuff around yeah. and and that's where it ended up and I don't know with better planning it would be in a better spot and yeah but. well that's that's a lot of these issues I think a lot of that all comes down to planning which mm -hmm. bleh, you know right um so um, then I got an email. Um, from Bill Fee, and Bill said, uh, you know, hey Logan, recently listened to the podcast, I uh, thought you were uh, listening to the podcast where you're pondering some considerations for a new shop. He said, after retiring in 2014, he built a 30 by 36 pole building for his shop, and it sits about 200 feet behind his house. Uh, he said, here's some thoughts on specific things you brought up. Uh, running water toilet. He said, I originally wanted a restroom with a toilet and sink, but decided against it for cost reasons. Um, however, he has a utility sink with running water. Uh, the water runs from the carboy on top of the sink into a bucket that he has under the sink. 
Um, so it's like a almost like a dry. What do they call it a dry sink? Sure. So, all right, we're gonna call it a dry sink. <laughs> he said he just has to carry the carboy to the house once in a while to fill it. Uh, but in the hot times of the year, the humid times of the year, he just empties his dehumidifier water into the carboy, so he has some water. Mm-hmm. Um, for internet, he uses. Uh, I use my electrical system to carry internet from my house to the shop. Seems weird, but it works. Um, I have a hundred amp service in my shop that is taken from the service at my house. My house is also where I have my cable modem for internet. You can buy the device below. He sent me a link that plugs into the outlet in your house and an outlet in your external shop. I don't understand how it works, but it does a pretty dang good job. He said I watched. Uh, vid- he watches video and TV in the shop with using this internet connection. Uh, and then, so I responded to him back, just hey Bill, you know, uh, thanks, I appreciate all your insight. Uh, did you find? I asked him if he found the thirty by thirty six size works for you, and he said. Uh, Interesting question, and I would answer yes, although there are times when I wish I ha- it was bigger and other times when I wish it was smaller. He said, I guess that means it's mm-hmm. about right. Uh, he moved from a 20 yeah. by 24, uh, so this one seems way bigger. In fact, the first thing he built in the new shop was a cart to move things from one area of the shop to the other. Um, so uh, he, was, he said the biggest thing that was given him nightmares was uh, he said fretted uh thing i fretted most was planning where to put electrical uh i have a 100 amp box with a mix of 220 and 110 circuits and put outlets in the ceiling for lighting as opposed to hardwiring the lights uh and he said of course they're wired to a switch and i'm this make i made was not putting in ceiling outlets that were not switched he said so things like my air cleaner and garage door <laughs> only work when the lights are on that's fair uh yeah. ideally i'd like i would have liked to put in a system he saw in popular work bringing in the complete wood shop guide um and he said uh it was the most flexible way to set up electrical to accommodate shop changes uh, unfortunately it was cost prohibitive for him at the time so i'll uh, put a link to that hmm. up there um so and i'll and bill actually has a link to his shop tour from instagram and i will when i get the when i get the shop notes page up or the show notes page up, I will uh, link that as well. So just kind of interesting. I'm, I'm glad people responded back to this. Um, a, building a shop's always like fun and exciting, but my God, there's a bunch of freaking headaches. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I don't know. I, lumber prices are falling though. So it, it's looking yep. a little more feasible for me. Um, but uh, the one guy uh, had mentioned seeing what it would do to property taxes and building codes um, and what, what building codes would allow. And I'm lucky that I live in the I'm gonna say country um, where I only have to deal with county codes. And technically, machine mm-hmm. sheds in my county are considered um, agricultural buildings. So they don't do anything with property taxes generally. Um, I don't know how that works by building a shop with running water in it. Um, that might be a thing I have to really look at. Um, I know what it would do to my property value if I did it. Um, so basically, if if a you know, it basically is seventy five percent of the building would add to property value. So if it was a you know just for a good round number, if it's a hundred thousand dollar building, it would add seventy five thousand in property value which would come back on property taxes, but um, you know, it's, it's money you would get out at if you ever want to move, um, just kind of as a general rule of thumb. So kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you could go down a whole rabbit hole on building shops. There's hypothetical shops. You can go so many different ways, so. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, this is an interesting question for you, John. Do you think there is such a thing as too big of shop? Hmm. Yeah, probably. I mean, if you had to go from one end to the other to to your drill from your drill press to your table saw. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but well, I don't know. It that... Seems like you could always fill it up with something. You know, like some people like have campers or cars. Anxiety you know, there. is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Fill it up with anxiety. Fill it up with anxiety. That's what I'm saying. <sighs> yeah. So I'm sure there's too big, but. I well, and see, and and the one that comes to mind is um, April Wilkerson's shop. Mm-hmm. She built a big old shop, 
and it's half woodworking, half metal. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't have any desire to pick up any other hobbies. I need very few metalworking things. Uh, I need my welder, That's and maybe a chop saw. That's pretty much it. I don't need a metalworking area. So my fear would be to build a shop that is too big. Um, because to me, I've seen guys that work in a machine shed or a pole barn. So if, if anybody doesn't know... Uh, are pole barn machine sheds are those term either one of those terms like a Midwest thing? I don't know. Okay, I mean, I mean they're, common they're common terms to me, but I'm I from they're the Midwest, common terms so. here. Yeah, so yeah. so they're basically um, the post frame construction is what they call them. Uh, I've seen pictures of guys that have built post frame construction buildings for their shops, and I look at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, there is nothing in there. Like, you built a mm-hmm. big building for not a whole lot of woodworking tools. Right. But then I start looking at it, and I start thinking, wow, they have they actually have a lot of woodworking tools. They just built a really big space. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's a lot of – I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is I think there is too big of – you could build a shop that's too big because you're heating and cooling the entire thing if it is yeah. – if it is conditioned. Um you're obviously the expense to build that big a shop, but a rule of thumb is, uh, at least for me, if I have a space, I'm going to fill it up. Right. So I would rather keep the space restricted and be very selective on what I have than just fill it up. Hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah, I have a 24 by 24 kind of oversized double garage, and that seems like a decent sized space to start with, and. I can always open my garage door and then my driveway becomes my shop as well. So, yeah, well, yeah. And what I'm, I guess what I am, uh, proposing building, proposing to my wife building is a 30 by 40. So it's really not that much bigger than what you have, John. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's six foot wider and about, well, it'd be 16 foot deeper. So it is a little bit bigger, but do you think, I mean, for a, does that seem about right for the yeah, type of woodworking so. you know for, that I do? Yeah, yeah. Um, enough, I guess. Because what, is that comparable to, that's bigger than the video studio space, it seems like. Uh, I Trying guess to I don't know. that to something else. I guess I don't know what our video or studio what space what our shop across the street is, but that, that seems like plenty. I would for, think so. For what you do, so. Yeah, I mean, and. I guess one of the big things is for, and this is something we've said, and you know, not to try to get away from talking about what I'm trying to do. Um, I think a lot of people just need to consider what type of projects they build when they're looking at building a shop. You know, and we've talked about this before a little bit. Like if if I decide I want to build a big armoire, let's say a, a, like a high boy or something. You obviously need space to move that around. You need space to be able to lay it on its back. You need space to, to just be able to maneuver around it. Um, so you need a little bit more open space in your shop for projects like that. Um, one of the <coughs> excuse me, one of the uh, projects that I would like to build soon and I'd like to sneak it into popular woodworking if I can uh, would be a um, a cedar strip canoe or a wood strip canoe. And I think it would be an interesting story if I could go out west and bring home some red cedar logs and mill them and just have the whole, evol- you know, the whole cycle would be kind of cool. But building a cedar strip canoe, you need like a 16 or 18 foot canoe. You need 24, 30 feet to be able to maneuver it around it. You know, mm-hmm. it's like that's a lot of space, you know, looking at, um, oh, uh, God, what's the guy from Parks and Recreation? Uh, the woodworker, uh, you know, him? Ron, Ron Swanson. Swanson. Yes. Uh, <laughs> look at Ron Swanson's shop. Nick Offerman. Nick Offerman. Thank you. Yeah. Look at Nick Offerman's shop. He builds a lot of canoes. Um, and he has a yeah. big, long, it looks like a warehouse, but a big, long warehouse that they build their canoes in when he does them. Uh, and it's like, you know what? Yeah, that makes sense. That, that is perfectly suited for what he's doing. Um, whereas, uh, uh my buddy that just that just dropped off the airport, Jimmy Clues, who's here filming with us for the week, um, was uh, he does turning. That's all he does. He, I mean, he's done flat work, and he would like to do some more flat work. 
but he does turning and he does it in a single stall garage well a stall and a half garage and he teaches classes of five or six in there and it's perfectly suited for what they do so um just kind of interesting um one other comment i had on the building the shop thing uh was from my buddy jim um jim said uh you know, hey, listen to the podcast talking about the external shop. Uh, he said, what I would do was just bury a Cat 6 line from your house. Then you wouldn't need a second internet service. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, Jim, thanks for giving me the obvious answer that makes the most sense. <laughs> like, yeah, I started thinking about it. I was like, yeah, like me, the big dummy. Like, yeah, well, of course. Why wouldn't I just do that? Because that makes sense. Uh, just bury the Cat 6 line out there so I have a a line and cat six can bury buried right in the ground so thanks jim that was way don't well, even bury it just geez, run it over yes. the ground that was pick it up when you're that was like way more obvious like, like that was that was one of those answers that was too obvious that i couldn't see it so i was like mm-hmm. you know that makes sense just pull a cat six cable so actually cat six i don't know if cat six can be buried if it's not in there's probably external cat six cables i don't know Probably. I don't know. I don't so, know. Cat six is the Ethernet connection. So just pull one of those from my modem out to a router out there. It'd be perfect. So yep. um and he said, Jim said he's like, I probably would do some outlets that could all be used uh used with any layout. Um he said, but he would not put the desk collection on the floor. So uh and Jim happens to be an electrician, so I may be leveraging his help if I end up building the shop. So we'll see. Hmm. Uh, I love to toss work to people I know. So, yeah. So just kind of interesting. I I got we got some pretty good response on that. So, but yeah. So I mentioned a little bit that uh, this week uh, we had a guest in town. Um, Jimmy Clues was here. Uh, we've been working on doing a video series with Jimmy for a long time. Um, so he was here filming with us for the week, um, filmed two different things, uh, well, three, filmed two videos that will be um, edited together and for sale, uh, and then he filmed an episode of our TV show for us, which was kind of cool, uh, with us, with me. Um, so I thought it was, it was fun. Um, you know, what did you, John, what did you think seeing a really good Turner in action? Oh, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was nice to have people come in and see what they do. It's nice to sit back and watch somebody else do the work. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, but, but yeah, he does amazing yeah, stuff. So. It was, uh, it was cool. So it was nice because you could tell that he's done some work in video before, and you could tell that he's been demonstrating mm-hmm. for 30 years. Cause there's a couple, there's just the way stuff works you end up doing the same thing a couple times and you, you end up hearing the exact same phrase multiple times because it's like, I mean, they're different videos. So the, the, the mm-hmm. uh, end user hasn't heard them. Uh, but it's like, yeah, Jimmy, you've done this for 35 years. You know, you you know, your spiel. So it was, it was fun. It was fun right. to, uh, to watch. Like you said, it's fun just to sit back and watch a master work. Right. Yeah. I've never done any turning. So it's like, watching him it's like oh it's probably pretty easy he's making it look really easy but then you you know think that he's been doing this for a long time and yeah a master of his craft so yeah it probably takes a little more practice than than that but that's i thought, I thought you were implying that watching me turn it doesn't look easy <laughs> yeah, no i mean watching anybody turn it's like or that you know knows what they're doing it's like yeah. oh that's pretty easy you just chuck up a piece of wood and you know, start turning. So yeah, no, it's so. funny because, uh, and this is just a little insight for people that are listening to us ramble, is that the first two days we filmed the classes. So so just people know what the classes are. Uh, one of the we call them classes. They're they're videos. They're uh, educational videos. Um, so the first video will be uh, an intro to turning. So. Uh, basic set of tools, their uses, how to sharpen the tools, and also some basic spindle turning and sp- basic bowl turning um, because the two are completely different. Um, and at the end of that video, uh, you end up turning 
a basic bowl and uh, putting some of the spindle work to to use to make yourself a shot mallet. So uh, you end up with two nice projects along with all the other info in the DVD or in the, the video. Uh, and then the second day, we rolled into the advanced class. Um, so the advanced turning uh, isn't what I would call, isn't necessarily what I would call advanced turning techniques, um, but um, they're more advanced than the basics. So it's it's like the next step in uh, somebody's like turning. Intermediate. Turning. Yeah, right. they're like intermediate yeah. turning. Um, one of which is a square Asian inspired box. It's a kind of an OG and it, it starts as a square blank. You turn it so you kind of got to watch out because there's a helicopter wing flying around as you're turning. Um, super cool. Some gilding on there um, and uh, just some interesting ways to hold the wood uh, so you can turn it. And also... Uh, one of Jimmy's signature things is his color rimmed platters. Um, the platter is is a pretty easy turn. Um, this is coming from somebody that has turned them before. Um, you know, they're one of the first things that I, I did turn. And they are fairly easy to turn if you follow the steps that Jimmy shows you. Because it's a very easy way to break it out and make an OG. And very easy way to do the rim and hollow it out but the coloring process is super interesting it's a layering of different dyes and pigmentations uh, so it's it's super interesting uh, to watch that uh, but I was going in a particular direction with that for a certain reason oh uh, because that was the second day that was the mm -hmm. the advanced turning or intermediate turning class um, we're calling it advanced class but it's more intermediate class um, and then the third day Jimmy and I film the TV show together. And I'll tell you what, we got into the car on Tuesday night to leave after we're done doing video. Uh, we were going out to a, a friend's house for, he was doing a kind of a little private demonstration for a few friends of mine. And he said, <laughs> Jimmy's English. And if anybody, he's from England. And if anybody has met Jimmy, you guys know probably exactly how he said this, but he said, heck man, glad we're done with these, first two videos but now the hard one and I said what do you mean the hard one he's like well he's like the TV one's the one I'm nervous about and I'm like why and he's like well he's like it's TV and I'm like oh no no the TV one will be easy and he didn't believe me and then I and then he really didn't believe me when I told him you know that colored rim platter that you just turned for the advanced DVD that it took an hour to turn and explain we get to condense that down into 22 minutes. And then his eyes got really big and, you know, he dropped a couple English curses at me. And it's like, hey, like, it'll be fine. Trust me. Uh, so what I'm getting at with this is when we when we filmed it on Wednesday, uh, we filmed it in a style that was like uh, a Jimmy and I talking about it. And then we just, I would step away from the lathe and let Jimmy turn it he would turn about what we just talked about and then when it comes to the editing process we'll drop that video over top of him and I talking so it's not just watching Jimmy and I have a discussion it's it's us talking about what he's going to do as you're seeing him do it uh, but what I'm the whole point of this story is that a Jimmy said he's like oh he's like I just have to turn it he's like that was all the talking we're gonna do is just me and you and then turn I was like yeah that's the, just turn it do it do what we just talked about mm -hmm. don't say anything just do it and it was really cool and Becky she turned to me as he started turning and that's like oh this is this is this is Jimmy turning this is not demonstrator Jimmy this is not TV Jimmy this is not you know somebody. This isn't Jimmy the Woodturner persona. This is Jimmy turning. And the speed at which he was able to do stuff and just watching him do stuff without worrying about saying anything, without worrying about explaining it to anybody how he's doing it, was very cool. Uh, and mm -hmm. I've I've seen that a couple of times. Um, I mean, I've seen it a couple of times with Jimmy, but I've seen it a couple of times with other people as well. And I just... If, if anybody ever gets the chance to go and truly watch a master of their craft just do their craft um take it I mean, just take it because 
these guys won't be around forever. I'm not saying that she was going to die on this plane as a flight back home, but like, yeah, <laughs> it's you know, God. Some. Sorry, Mary. Uh, but like, I've I've also watched uh, Al Breed, um, one of the nation's top carvers. I mean, he's right up there with Mary May and a lot of these other carvers. Uh, the master of reproduction furniture and of period furniture. And I took a class with him at Mark Adams School, which was phenomenal. If anybody ever has a chance to do it, should do it. Uh, but one night, he said, all right. He's like, after dinner, he's like, we're going to sit down and carve a – this is not part of the class. He's like, but anybody that wants to stay around, I'm going to show you guys how I carve a uh, ball and cloth foot. So he had a mahogany blank, and he just stood there for – it took him like 14 minutes. Like, I don't know anybody in the world that can carve a ball and cloth foot in 14 minutes. But he did it, and just sitting there watching him do it, not talking to us, not – I mean, Al was kind of explaining what he was doing, but he was more just doing it. Um, and it was so cool. Like, like, screw you guys. I hate you guys. You guys are masters of your craft <laughs> for a reason. I get it. Yeah. I understand it. So, Yeah, watching um, Jimmy is, like, like I mentioned, a lot like watching uh, Chris Fitch. When they're demonstrating, they're kind of doing it all in – first gear and doing it slowly and explaining and showing. And then if you just turn them loose and like he's turning or Chris is like doing his thing, it's just like their fifth oh, gear. And they're God, just I zipping know. through with a bandsaw or turning, or it's just like, yeah, just amazing I, to yeah, watch. I, so. I agree with you. I will say Chris is the, Chris is one of the very few people in the world that have zero regard for feed speeds on saws. Like, yeah, like Chris is a push it through as hard and fast as I can. And it just yields to him. Like, you yep. know. Yep. All right. You got anything else, John? I figure this would be a short episode today. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, let's do a short one so people can enjoy their oh, holiday yeah. weekend. Yeah, it is three-day weekend. Woo! So, you got any plans for the weekend? Yep. So, uh, I don't know. I'm sure we'll find some beverages and some place to swim and light nice. fireworks. Yeah. Celebrate freedom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I tell Whatever you what, I'm going to sell on the couch this weekend. So. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm going to do some work and sell on the couch. Sure. So. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, yeah. thank you again for listening to the Shop Notes podcast. Uh, make sure you guys go to wherever you listen to this podcast. You're already there because you're listening to us right now. And drop a rating. <laughs> uh, don't drop our rating, but drop a leave a rating. A good one is preferable, but honest ones are best. And we will see you guys next week on the Shop Notes podcast. This episode of Shop Notes Podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build. From furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects and jigs and more. Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com.